Let's get to the water blueprint. So what is the Arizona water blueprint? It is basically a water data hub. It is a dynamic web-based application that can be a tool for dialogue and planning around water in the state. And how many of you have used uh, Esri's ArcGIS platform? Anyone in here familiar or have used GIS? So GIS is an amazing technology which allows users to take maps and then layer data or enrich map attributes with data. And then we can visualize what's going on with data in a, in a way that's tied to geography or tied to other attributes. So it's a very powerful way of thinking about certain subjects. And it's particularly powerful and relevant when we're talking about water. Because when we're, water is a complex adaptive system. What you do in one place inevitably has impacts in another place. And it's all about um, very much tied to place and, and regions and even more broadly than regions. So that's what the Arizona Water Blueprint is. It's an effort to take uh, the, the data and the geography of Arizona water resources and put it on a map with many, many layers uh, and enrich it with a tremendous amount of data and then actually even put on this map the policy discussions that we're having, the concepts that we have for augmentation um, and for long-term water resilience. So at this point, it's a little cut off on the left, but at this point the map has, I can go like this and you can see, has uh, a, a, about 36 layers, as you can, hopefully you can see, and the print's not too small. But we have everything from the geographic layers like watersheds and rivers and streams, things that you would expect to um, the constructed layers, the CAP canal, the SRP canals, the Verde ditches. Um, we have every water treatment plant in Arizona on the map. Uh, we have um, the political boundaries like irrigation districts, active management areas, adjudication sub areas, municipal boundaries, all kinds of um, political sort of man-made boundaries, uh, CAP, member lands and member service areas not applicable up here but very applicable down in Maricopa, Pinal and Pima counties and then we have ideas for augmentation how to get new water supplies to places um, on our map as well as infrastructure that's proposed in order to deliver those new water supplies so a very we already have 36 layers we probably will add at least five additional layers and so for everything on the map every single thing we can enrich that attribute, for example, um, an irrigation district. We can enrich the irrigation district boundaries with data about the district, which may not be so, may or may not be interesting to you all, but it might be very interesting to some other group. Or, um, for example, Prescott Valley. We have the boundaries of Prescott Valley on the map. We have the boundaries of the Prescott Valley water service area on the map, and we can enrich those, um, those, uh, that those pieces of information with data about, as we already have on the map, the population that's served. We could add information like the, um, the average water use for people who are served in that service area. We can enrich anything with a lot of other bits of data. So I think of it as matrices. Every little attribute can have a, lo a lot of information in a matrix. So this map is no, I'm doing it wrong. Very good for spatial exploration. Um, I, I came up two weeks ago and John Munderlow led me and, and my team from the Kyle Center for Water Policy on a tour of um, Prescott Valley's sort of water plan and then we went up to the Big Chino and John, you know, we stood out in a field and are actually overlooking <laughs> a field and John explained Prescott Valley and Prescott's plans for more water in the future and um, there was nothing for me like actually coming and seeing it for having the tour to really understand and hear from John what the plan was long term it, but we know that we can't always get everybody to agree to come and take a tour to see what a plan is for water and yet water is so tied to geography it's really critical that we think about it in those terms well the water blueprint is the next best way for somebody to understand what's going on with water. And here's an example, um, if I can make it work, 
of this is a very basic tour of the um, how really it's kind of a tour of how does water get to Yuma in southwestern Arizona, which is a big agricultural reason, re region, as you know. And so here you can, you can trace from Lake Mead to the, to the uh, reservoirs that are south of Lake Mead and eventually get to Imperial Dam, which is really out of which the water is delivered to the irrigation districts. And here are the irrigation districts in Yuma. And this is my colleague, Susan Craig, who's, who t she uh, recorded herself doing this tour. She selects the irrigation districts, looks, kind of explores the irrigation districts in Yuma. And then she decides to select all of them. And this way, she can pull up an attribute table, which is essentially a data table. And this data table can be populated with a great deal of information about these irrigation districts. When was each established? How, ma how many acres of agriculture is each of them uh, delivering water to? What are the principal crops? Uh, you, you know, what kind of um, water rights do they have? All of that information, it isn't in this video, but it, it will eventually be populated in this data table. And then she changes the base map so that she can actually just look for herself and say, what's happening under those districts? And you can see that there's an enormous amount, all those little squares and circles our agriculture that this, these irrigation districts are still largely delivering to agriculture. So that's an example of spatial exploration that we can do with the map. But there's so much more that we can do with this tool beyond spatial exp exploration. Um, we can do really much more elaborate data visualizations. So here's one which is, I, I was kind of curious about this. Phoenix has a number, the Phoenix area has a number of irrigation districts that harken back to when the Phoenix area was, you know, in the 20s and 30s when it was primarily an agricultural region. And I thought, I wonder, what is the coincidence of subsidence with irrigation district boundaries? I was just curious. You know, subsidence is when the aquifer essentially collapses because of the withdrawal of water from it. And so these cross-hatched areas are irrigation districts in Phoenix, and I zoomed in and looked at irrigation districts, and then I put over it the subsidence layer. And I, it was really interesting to me to see that there is a great co-location, very significant co-location of subsidence with irrigation districts. It's a complicated story why that's the case. Um, it's not, I, I'm not saying this to diss the irrigation districts at all, but it's a real fact and it's really very interesting from a water management perspective. This is a data visualization that was not taken from our map, but it's an example of another kind of data visualization that you can do with this tool. And you all have probably seen something like this. This is a map that was made to show drought in California between 2011 and 2017. This is 2011, and the redder, the hotter, the coloration on the map, the um, worse the drought condition. And then a layer is, a new layer is slid over the map to show drought condition in 2017. It's a very powerful visual to show a change in drought condition um, from one time to another. This is a very easy thing to do on the kind of platform that we're creating. Um, that's an example of changes over time that you can do with this map. And here's another example of changes over time. This is a related tool that we're, gonna, that we're integrating into our current map. But essentially, this shows um, development of wells over time in the upper San Pedro. So there are a few places in the state where there's a big concern that there's been a lot of population growth in the last, say, 30 years. And that growth is largely dependent on wells. And there's a concern that, the, that, that there, for various reasons, that kind of um, use of water that's pumped out of wells isn't sustainable. This is, uh, let's see if I can go back and do it again. <laughs> it went pretty fast. Um, this shows well development between 1932 and 2017, and each of those dots is a well, and you can see, and then it finally goes to clustering the wells. Um, and you know, there are clusters there that have 344 uh, wells in them, so a tremendous uh, increase in numbers of wells in the upper San Pedro. Here's one from our map. Let's see if I can, I think I have trouble making this play. Let's see, um, that shows and get this going, yeah, that shows this is a similar, as I say, under construction. This is using 
the Department of Water Resources, wait a minute, ah, he's doing so well there. Um, the Department of Water Resources have a, has a database called the Wells 55 database, which is um, a database of wells that, that the department thinks have been drilled. <laughs> and this is, a, we're using the Wells 55 database on our map to show well development, and for some reason, um, our graduate student who developed this decided to pick the time from 1879 to 1987. But <laughs> the red dots are wells over the decades, and I can read it down here. This is, eight, this is 1915, 1923, 1931, sort of traces the development of Arizona. It gets redder and redder. This is 50, 63 now, this is 63. We're trying to work on not having it be so jumpy. But it gives you a sense of what's been happening. Now this is 1987, so you can see there's been a tremendous amount of groundwater development in the last, you know, oh, it would be even redder now, much redder, and there'd be some places where it would be much more intense. But you can see that the state has grown a lot on wells. Now, why is that a concern? Any water manager can tell you that in most places where communities depend on wells for their water, they are withdrawing well water faster than it's recharged. Why? Because it doesn't rain much in Arizona. And so we're growing some communities in some parts of the state on, on uh, non-replenishing resources, and in particular in some parts of the state large ag is moving in and they're very big heavy water users and so that you know it's really changing the long-term sustainability of the water resources for those communities now I can say all those words but it's not nearly as impactful as seeing a visual and imagine I don't have this here I wish I did but imagine if I just pulled up one of the hotspot communities if I if I zoomed in to um, Mojave County or to the Verde Valley or to a Wilcox Playa and showed you and you could see that over the last 50 years those areas have pretty much gone from just a few little red dots to being filled in with red. It's a, it's a very powerful visual. And, and I'll, I'll get to why it's important to have <laughs> such powerful visuals um, in just a moment. So the other place where we see the blueprint as being very helpful is in our discussions that we're having as a state about where we're going to get our future water supply. There, um, there are lots of communities that are looking for their next bucket of water, and there is actually an effort underway in the state. Um, I'm part of uh, the governor's Water Augmentation Innovation and Conservation Council. I'm proud of myself for being able to remember the name of that. Uh, <laughs> And we have a subcommittee uh, that has been meeting for over two years, and I've been part of this, that's looking at what are the, the options for augmentation for these different parts of the state that want to grow and don't know where they're going to get their water to grow. Or maybe they don't even necessarily need the water so much for growth as they need it just for their future water supply because they are dependent on groundwater supplies that are non-replenishing. And so we're looking at these various options. And what, what I've learned is it, it, the easy part is thinking of some grandiose engineering project that's going to move water from one place to another. That's not hard. Um, there are people with amazing ideas, uh, drag icebergs, you know, from, from north, you know, from Alaska to LA, and we'll take some of LA's Colorado River water, or um, uh, a pipeline from the Missouri River that will empty into the Virgin River. It'll go right along the, the interstate and empty into the Virgin River, and and then that, all that water will flow down the Colorado River and problem solved. Or a desalination plant in the Sea of Cortez near Rocky Point and we'll just, we'll just pipe all that water up to the West Valley of Phoenix. I mean, those are all engineering ideas and to, to greater or lesser extent, they're probably all feasible, you know, with enough money and enough, you know, get through the environmental litigation and all of that, you could probably make all of those happen but they're all very, very expensive. And a lot of times we have these discussions about growth and the next water supply without really grounding those discussions in the realities of um, how we can make those things happen. And are those the best things we could be doing? Could, be, could we be working more on um, the demand side, for example, on reducing use before we go looking for more water? Could be, we be looking at voluntary reallocations 
that both sides would um, be happy to enter into before we make big investments in new water supplies. By the way, all of the attributes of this map, these are from that governor's uh, water council's committee that I serve on, and every little dot reflects a different kind of water augmentation project or an icon. So we have brackish groundwater desalination. There's quite a lot of water underground in Arizona that could be um, pumped out, but it's, it's very brackish. It's full of salts and minerals, and it would need to be um, desalinated before it could be used. Um, the big problem with brackish groundwater desalination is that it produces a brine that's a really nasty brine, and it's very expensive to figure out what you do with it. You know, nobody wants it. If you're on the ocean, you just put it back in the ocean, and it's sort of, that's okay. But if you're, you know, in Buckeye or uh, Goodyear, what do you do with your brine? It's, it's a very difficult problem. And the desal itself is energy intensive and expensive. Um, we have ideas for how to exchange water so that, see there, there's one right there. Someone, we could build a desal plant down here that Mexico could use because Mexico gets water from the Colorado River and then maybe we could build it, we meaning people who want more water and take Mexico's water here or really it would be a little bit up here where the CAP canal is in exchange for a desal plant that Mexico would use. So that's an idea. And another, um, that's, that's basically, those are the main concepts for augmentation. But as I say, um, and, and I have to say that I am often asked by elected officials, why isn't Arizona having a conversation about ocean desal? I get, you know, <laughs> and I've been asked by mayors from cities all over the West, like why are, why are the states not working on ocean desalination? And my answer is they are. You know, they really are. There's a serious ongoing planning discussion. Um, but it really is not a simple, easy fix for water supply for any place in the West. Um, and so what we can do with the water blueprint is provide information that grounds those discussions. An example of the kind of data that we can attach to each of these projects would be the cost, um, the capacity of a community to actually uh, afford that project, that's, a, that's probably the number one impediment to any, any kind of augmentation project. The regulatory hurdles, the real timeline for making it happen, who are the potential users or beneficiaries of that water, and who are the potential partners in making something like that happen. And I really want to focus for, you know, to, to emphasize a lot of the places in the state that want more water because they, there is an aspiration for growth the, the real challenge is not where is that water supply, what is the engineering solution. The real challenge is finding the balance between the population growth um, to, into affording that project. So I, it could be, you know, years and years ago, my husband and I got married and we knew we wanted children and we wanted to buy a home that would have room for our children and we bought a home that had room for some children that we could afford, and it wasn't big enough when we had three, <laughs> when our third came along. <laughs> and if you're trying to do a water project, it's the same thing. Um, the, the Prescott Valley's plan for the Big Chino, that's, that is a, it's a, you know, probably one of the most credible, doable projects, but it's very expensive, probably $150 million to develop that project at a minimum, maybe more, I've heard quoted more, and when will Prescott Valley and Prescott be in a position to afford that kind of investment? You would need a bigger population and you need to be sure that you grow into a large enough population to make that big investment pay off. So that, that to me is the capacity issue and it's one of the biggest challenges in, in a water augmentation scenario. So another thing that the blueprint, our water blueprint is gonna be very helpful for is for having um, realistic discussions about municipal water resilience. In Arizona, how well any property owner is doing for water certainty very largely depends on how well their water provider is doing. And so often I get asked is should I buy a home here or there? Is it a good idea for me to buy a home in this place or buy property in this place? I get asked by developers. I've had developers come meet with me and say, um, should we be developing in this or that county, this or that city? 
And that's something that we can answer on the blueprint. So it'll make some kinds of land use um, decisions a lot easier. And here's an example of being on the blueprint, picking out the city of Chandler. Maybe, maybe somebody's read a lot of articles in the paper about what's going on with the Colorado River water and thinks, I don't know, is Chandler a good place to buy? Well, on the blueprint, this, this uh, user would be able to pull up information about Chandler and see that Chandler's supply, 101,000 acre feet of water, is much larger than its current demand, 73,000 acre feet of water. And could also see here that Chandler has a diverse portfolio of, of water from different sources, which gives it a little bit of resilience. And so that user could have a little bit of reassurance that Chandler might is probably a pretty good place to buy a home or to invest. And if, the, if he or she wanted more, uh, he could click the link to our scorecards that we're developing. The Kyle Center is at the same time as we're developing the blueprint, we're developing scorecards on the, muni on the resilience of municipal water providers. So we have completed our Chandler scorecard and there would be a lot of information for that person about how well um, that particular city is doing with water. So that's a kind of high level idea of what the blueprint is. And let's talk about the need. Well, um, here's the major need. In Arizona, every time we get a new governor, maybe more than, maybe sometimes more than with every governor, sometimes twice or three times with any given governor, we have a major water planning effort. Our leaders recognize that water is truly the gas and the brakes of the economy of Arizona and our well-being, our prosperity, our quality of life. It's down to water because water is the limited resource in the state. And so every governor calls the great water thinkers of the state together to have a prolonged process of planning for the long-term water future. And they, the, these people get together they're called water buffaloes, by the way. That's their, yeah, yeah, you've heard of that. Anyway, the, and, they, and they are really ingenious. They're very thoughtful and they're dedicated and they spend collectively, seriously, thousands of hours. I've met for two years on that augmentation subcommittee, for example. I mean, day long meetings every month or two for two years. So imagine, you know, the thousands of hours that are invested. And then what happens is it get, the work of these groups gets summarized in a report. The report can, is usually, you know, minimum 300 pages. Very likely, the most, one of the most recent ones was more like 600 pages. And then it becomes a PDF, and it's posted on the Department of Water Resources website, and then it, it sort of recedes, and it gets harder and harder to find. And a PDF is pretty awkward to work with anyhow. And if you are not somebody who was part of that process, you would have a very hard time with those reports. You would have a hard time finding out what was the thinking, what is the thinking. And that just doesn't make sense in this day and age. We can put it on a map. We can put the data in places where it's accessible to people, where this kind of important thinking and planning is happening. And we can broaden the audience for it so that you don't have to be a water expert who knows a million acronyms to be able to read about it and understand what's going on. And so that's, the, to me, the crying need for the water blueprint. We will integrate, we are integrating these efforts that, that have been going on, and we can keep it available, accessible to people brought outside of the water planning community, and we can update it continually so that it stays relevant. But there are other needs too, and that got, kind of goes to our audience. One, some of the feedback that we, you know, the Kyle Center for Water Policy, we're, we're about to turn five years old in a few months. And it took me, I was the first director, I'm still the director, I guess I didn't really introduce myself the way I was supposed to, but it took me a long time to understand exactly how a water policy think tank based at ASU could add value, could be helpful in the water discussion. And some of the most interesting feedback that I've heard is from people involved in discussions with decision makers, from elected officials to town managers to uh, developers. And that is that it's helpful to have an, an independent entity come in and say things. Um, if you're a water director for a city and you get a sort of, sort of poor grades on our scorecards, you know, our, our feedback from water directors is thank you very much because they know they know that where they are with water. 
and it's very helpful for them to take the scorecard that the Kyle Center developed to their town manager or their city council and say, remember how we talked about that rate increase so that we could, you know, make an investment in infrastructure? You know, we really do look at our score. That's not going to be good for us. Um, and the blueprint is the same. Discussions about augmentation, discussions about reallocation, all of those things, we need to, a value that, the, that we can add as the Kyle Center is to provide factual information about these topics that entities can look at together, um, that, where that information, it forces some conversations that might not be comfortable. So that's a, that's a big value of this. Our regulating agency, the Department of Water Resources, its job is not to pass judgment on uh, the smartness of this or that project. Its job is to make sure that water planning happens consistent with the laws and regulation of Arizona. And so that's kind of where, where the Kyle Center, we think, can add value with our blueprint. So that takes us to the audience. We think of our audience as two kinds of people. The first is people who want to know. And I think probably you all are representative of that, that you would bother to come to, <laughs> to hear about the blueprint today. And we think that people who want to know will go to the blueprint, and, and there are a lot of them. Um, they might be uh, staff of elected officials or staff of cities and towns. Um, they might be land use, people in land use, developers, realtors, uh, land use lawyers, water lawyers. Um, they might be people in construction, people who are just community activists who want to know, you know, they care about their communities and they want a bigger picture. Maybe they're worried about the whole state. They will dig in. They'll go to the map. They will take their own tours, as you, like the one we started out with, where you think, where, where is Yuma getting that water? And they will tour and they'll dig in and they'll figure out how to use the map. And then the other kind of people for, for, that make up the audience of the blueprint are the people who should know. And so to some degree, this might be elected officials or legislative staff or other people, people um, who are influential in terms of investments uh, and the direction of different communities and the state as a whole. And we know that many of the people who should know are probably not going to be motivated to just go to the blueprint and you know, pull up, let's say, water treatment facilities and do their own exploration about what are the interesting interconnections we could have here that would mean that we would be using uh, reclaimed water in ways that boost the resilience of communities. Um, that, that isn't something that I would expect the people who should know necessarily to do, although that is something anyone could do going to the map. The good thing is that we can create guided experiences using the ArcGIS platform that the map is based on. So what it will feel like when you go to the blueprint is a website that says, do you want to just go in and play around in this map? Or would you like to learn about one of these topics? And, one, and that, those topics will be guided experiences. Um, they're under, Esri, the platform that we're using, calls these story maps. And they have many examples. They're very powerful. Uh, this is where we are now with the story maps that we want to have at the launch of the blueprint. And I would welcome your input on what you think would be important story maps, important guided experiences for this blueprint to include. But this is where we are now. And this is an example of a story map. And I think I tried to, uh, yeah, I can run this. So this is not part of the Arizona Water Blueprint, to be sure. This is from, uh, uh, the, from the city of Nashville. And this is a story map that they developed that shows low income, low impact development. It's a tour. And so you can see over here on the left are essentially little, pro you can pick, it's, it's little cards that show the different low impact projects. And they're tabbed, so there are different types of projects, pervious pavement, pavement green roof, um, infiltration. We don't, we don't worry about infiltration here, but anyway, I can play the little video so you can see how this is organized. Okay. And, and, it's, um, and what's cool about it is it integrates the map so well. We can envision doing this, for example, with the, uh, and of course my, my colleagues, there we go, I had to mute the sound. So you click one of those little cards and you can go to something, you see where it is, and you can pull up information about it. So that's, we, you can imagine doing that, for example, with 
proposed augmentation projects all around the state or some other category. So there are many different kinds. One kind of story map that you all have probably experienced is called Cascade. And you, you probably have gone to this where it seems like all you do is scroll down in a website. You go, and it's like there's nowhere to go except you keep, you keep scrolling down. <laughs> Has anyone had that? <laughs> it's, like I, it's like these pages, are they keep rolling up from the bottom of the screen. That's a, like an Esri story map format. So anyway, it's a, it's, that is an example of a story map that would enable us to talk about various topics um, in water policy that uh, in a way that's very accessible and, and comprehensible to people who are not necessarily water experts or natural resource experts. So that brings me to why ASU. You know, we're not a water agency. It seems like kind of odd that ASU would be, you know, we'd be putting ourselves out there and saying we're going to be the people who make this happen. And, and I think ASU is obviously, I think it's the perfect choice for this. Uh, the reason being that we have a visionary leader in President Michael Crow who has charged ASU with being a new kind of public institution, a new kind of university. Um, ASU has entered into a charter with the people of Arizona. The charter is all over the place in ASU buildings and we're reminded constantly that this is our responsibility, that this is our charter as ASU employees with the people of Arizona. And as part of that charter, we have taken responsibility for the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities we serve. We're not just here to, to run people through to get degrees. We're here to use the knowledge and the resources of ASU to help uh, with community well-being. And that's, that's very fundamental to what the Water Blueprint is about. It's about fostering well-informed discussions about the state's future long-term water resilience. The charter of ASU has certain design aspirations, I would think of these as design guidelines, that are very applicable to the blueprint. And they include leveraging our place, what better than a water resources data hub for the state of Arizona, valuing innovation and entrepreneurship. We're using um, established but new types of visualization and technology to uh, expand the conversation and enhance the water planning conversation and dialogue. Um, conducting use-inspired research, meaning let's do research that's actually useful for people. That's the blueprint. And then also being socially embedded, making sure that the work we're doing is of value to the people who are all around us, the communities in which we live. Probably some of those other guidelines apply too, but those are my favorite. And why the Kyle Center for Water Policy? Well, the Kyle Center for Water Policy is part of Morrison Institute for Public Policy, which is a policy institute that has been um, in Arizona for almost 40 years. It's part of ASU. And the, our mission is to promote informed public dialogue on critical issues to Arizona and the West. And very fundamental to our work is that it's nonpartisan, that it's data-driven, and that it's contextualized into the history of how we got here, that it's by Arizona for Arizona and not, uh, for example, by someone in New York for Arizona. So this is very fundamental to the work of Morrison Institute and uh, as the director of the Kyle Center, I'm very proud of these guidelines as how we do our work. And we need this. The state needs someone who has no dog in the water fight, no vested interest in what's going on with water to be taking a look at, at what's going on in water planning and to make, to make sure that we're getting important facts about, about the planning and aspirations out there. So just a word about our process and our timing and uh, sort of how we're doing it. Um, Jim participated in a charrette. We, we uh, borrowed this term from the world of architecture. I thought everyone probably knew it. It turns out not so many people know it, but a charrette is a um, meeting or workshop where a group of people come together and give input to try to solve a problem or design something. So w the small staff of the Kyle Center for Water Policy, we didn't think that we should have the last word on what should go into the water blueprint. Um, our sense was 
the state is very rich with water experts, land use experts, economic development experts, and others. And those are the folks who should have input into the content of the water blueprint. So to date, we have held 11 charrettes. Um, and we have a few more places uh, in the state to hit. Um, and I regard today's meeting because I want your input as one of those, as maybe our 12th. Um, but essentially, you know, you've all heard the term crowdsourced. I like to think of the blueprint as expert sourced, that it will, that it is sourced by people who really are important to get input, give input into it. We also think it's very important to point out that rather than I having the last word on what goes in and making sure that it's accurate, we are relying on the Kyle Center for Water Policy Advisory Board as the final reviewing body um, for the water blueprint. We have a statewide board of the state's leading water experts and they've been tracking the project. They're very uh, interested uh, in, in, its, in, in our progress and in the final product. And then the timeline. Um, we're on track uh, to meet our goal of launching the blueprint in uh, spring of 2020. Um, we, we are in the process of, we're, we've had quite a few charrettes. We have 36 layers. We have a, a selection of story maps to develop, but we, we will um, have more charrettes and more ideas uh, integrated into the map. At this point now, we are working with a web developer so that it will be to ensure that our vision for this continually updatable organic plan for water resilience for the state will fit into a website that any user can go to and to find it very accessible and easy to use and that we can keep adding and changing the story maps that are the guided tours that we include. So we're looking at a spring 2020 launch and um, one of the, th the input that we got most frequently in our charrettes with water experts was we hate tools like this because the data becomes obsolete so quickly and it's so irritating that people go to these tools and, they, and it's irritating for them that the data are old but even worse people who don't know that the data are old go look at them and then they rely on bad information so um, we can reassure <laughs> such folks that the beauty of using the ArcGIS platform is that we can update pretty much continually all but one layer of the blueprint is from a public, are from public agencies. All of the layers are from public agencies. And Arizona is really at the forefront of uh, a commitment to use GIS to be collecting um, geospatial information so that um, we can use it in all kinds of decisions. I mean, there's another person at Morrison Institute who's using GIS data to map child neglect in the state and to to be able to find out what are the hot spots of child neglect and that could influence how the Arizona Department of Child Protection I think it's called can respond to child neglect if it's very if there are these big hot spots then it may be a something about a community or a place and not just about what's going on in a family that's just an example of GIS um, in the case of water uh, you know it makes much it makes absolute sense that uh, the state agencies that are involved in managing water supply, quality, moving it, delivering it, that they are using ArcGIS. And we have a data hub called AGIC, the um, Arizona Geographic Information Council, that is the clearinghouse of all of the data the different agencies and even non-governmental um, organizations are gathering, GIS data. So we're part of the AGIC um, community and that ensures that our data are continually updated because we're just borrowing the layers that these other entities are putting in. This way the map can constantly reflect changes, the, the, any changes, new infrastructure, um, other, anything that's going on in water, drought, whatever, what new storage, anything that's happening in water. So our dream is that uh, when we launch in spring of 2020 we will have we'll have a lot of logos there we're working on it but we want to have you know 25 or 30 logos we want we have SRP CAP the city of Phoenix we want to have we don't have CAP yet we will but we want to have all the water agencies that you all can think of um, on this on on our blueprint as supporters and contributors to it so that's what I have to show you I would like to go back to our layers let's see it's a lot to go back to and let me just go back here and say 
I really welcome your um, input, your feedback. Uh, and then I'm going to go back to our data layers and ask you, what do you think should be on this blueprint? Let's go all the way back up here. So any thoughts? Don't be shy. Do you, do you have a layer that shows how much recharge communities are doing as an augmentation? Yeah, it's a very good question. We have, it's hard to pull that together. We have all the, we have some recharge sites to the degree that anyone's creating layers about it, we do. And in our water, um, if you pull up a particular water provider, we have information about how they're doing with recharge. So if you pulled up um, Prescott Valley, you could pull, you could, we can have that information because Prescott Valley is reporting that to the Department of Water Resources. Yeah. Yes. Do you identify the aquifers in the state? Yes, we do have the groundwater basins, aquifers. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. Good question. And our hope is to be able to put d supply and demand information with each aquifer. So if you pick, if you selected in the map and said, I want to look at aquifers, that every time you clicked on one, demand and supply information would pop up. The reality is, we, and, and I think that's part of the beauty of the blueprint. We have that for some. We don't have it for all. We don't, we don't have a concerted program to find that out, and it's a really important bit of information. And I think one of the great strengths of the blueprint is it shows what we're not doing that we should be doing as well as what we are doing. Like all those wells. Those wells are, you know, they're not going in here because pr we're in an active management area here. And there's a, there's a regulation of wells for long-term sustainability of the aquifer. But that, that visual that showed all that red, there, there's no regulation in those places. And that's a visual that tells you, ooh, Arizona maybe needs to get on the stick about well development. Yes, Jim. So groundwater basins are also divided into sub basins. Mm -hmm. so sub basin delineation. Yeah, well. I don't. We have sub watersheds, so yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah, to the degree that they are mapped, we have them. Okay. It's a good question. Yes. Do you show? Um, I'll call it a before and after. So you brought up Chandler. Mm -hmm. And if you said a hundred years ago, Chandler was mostly a farming community and used this many acre feet of water farming. Today, they're mostly developed. And they retire farming rights to develop. And mm -hmm. they yeah, yeah. Do you have that layer where you can see. I don't think that we have. I don't. I would love to have that. I. I don't know where we would get that information. That'd be hard. Yeah, but I would. I think it. it that to me is a very important story map. That whole transition in many parts of the state, from using water for agriculture to using water for urban purposes. It's certainly the Phoenix area. That's the big story. And I think it's important to tell. I don't know if we can tell it as a layer, but I like it as a story map. So I'll note that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even here, even up here, that's, I mean, that's yeah, kind of the like story of the. Uses less water than typically, the typically. Yep. You'd have to guesstimate what they were using. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Years ago. You might be able to find it because, you know, there was, there were irrigation districts and we kind of know what was being grown. We would guesstimate, I guess, but I think it's a very, that is an important piece of information about water planning. There are a lot of cities that were, you know, the throwback farming cities um, in, the, in Arizona that really have a lot of room to grow within their supplies because of the gradual conversion of ag to urban. And people often point the finger at those cities and say they're so wasteful of water. They have lawns and they, you know, they're, it's terrible that there's so much water use in those cities and it's, from the minds of the water planners, that's a good thing because that's room to grow, that, that you, you know, you're not at the very edge of your supply so that you would have to go find more water if you wanted to add more uh, demand. Yes? I don't know if I want to state this right, but do you have a weather layer that indicates what years are wetter and which ones are drier? Yeah. So that you can, you can see where did the climate's changing? Yeah, I think it's very important that we add, so I'm going to, make a couple notes here. I think adding that information, um, you know, is climate information is very important. Yeah. And we, we do need to make sure that we're including it. Others? 
Um, it's defined by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and so it's important because it has legal implications uh, for endangered species. There we go. Um, but we don't just have those critical habitats. We also have important bird areas, which are, so I said U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but it's really, it's really the State Department of Game and Fish um, uh, as part of the, the wildlife management plan that Game and Fish presents to Fish and Wildlife in accordance with Fish and Wildlife's guidelines. So it's a, it's a kind of combination of the state and the, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we have important bird areas, which are uh, also primarily, they're sort of affirmed by the Game and Fish Department. And they're, they're actually, the data for them are collected by Audubon, by a, a, a conservation, bird conservation organization. So there was an effort years ago in one of those many, many statewide planning um, efforts that I mentioned where they got, they spent some time identifying habitats that were important water dependent habitats. And it's kind of interesting, it's, a, uh, it's not a very big list. And they said these are like the 20 places in Arizona that are important natural areas where as a state we should make a big commitment to make sure that we're delivering, you know, that we don't, that there's water. And, um, and it's really good work. I mean, there are a lot of meetings went into identifying them. And so I have been trying to you know, see, did anyone ever create the layers, which are in GIS um, parlance, they're called shape files. So I've been going after you know, to all the agencies and conservation organizations that, that I can think of and say, do you have shape files of, the, of this list, of the places on the, this list? And no one, no one has shape files, which is kind of interesting. It was 2012 when that work was completed. But that, like, what good work? That's really good that statewide, you know, the statewide conversation would come up with this list, and yet it would never, it, it's just a list on a PDF in a 350 page document that, you know, you, you would not be able to access unless you knew about it and knew where to go to find it. Other thoughts, questions? Would you go back to the Chandler slide? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sure. Let's get over to that. We're almost there. There we go. So this is the blueprint with the municipal boundaries popped up. And you can, so there you can pick your boundary, whatever city. And this is information, this, this right now this is supply and demand information that is um, reported by the city of Chandler to the Department of Water Resources every year. So we're using that annual reporting data. And then what, we, what the Kyle Center has done apart from this information, the, the big, the, the circles are, um, they're designed to show the contrast between supply and demand. So there's a big circle for supply and the demand circle is only three-fourths the size of the big circle. So you know they have extra water. Um, their demand is not built out. And it shows each color is a different source of supply. So you can get an idea of where Chandler's getting its water. And then you, if you want, you can click a link to this other <laughs> more detailed information, which is a project of the Kyle Center. We work with the water department, water directors, basically, to develop scorecards on five categories of water resilience. It's a time consuming, this is a very time intensive project. It's a great project for grad students, I can tell you, because we have all these, uh, I have to say, it's sustainability students at ASU who really don't know, um, they, they don't have a lot of opportunity for practical work, to really think practically. They have beautiful ideas, but they don't get into the practicality of it. And so it's great for them to have to really drill down and think about what is a community doing with water? Where are they getting it? Where are they delivering it? What are their real opportunities? Um, so that's who we have this little core of grad students who are developing these scorecards. And it gives them a chance to work with people who are out there really doing this hard work and um, develop relationships. So in this case, we're looking at the, the current supplies. We've renamed that first category to current demand, the capacity of the city to meet current demand, 
capacity for growth to meet demand from growth, how well they're managing their infrastructure, how well they're planning for various eventualities like drought, and then how well they're doing with encouraging people to conserve water, or we call it water consciousness. So, yes? How many more people can the state handle with the water resources that you know that we have? Yeah, it's a good question. There are some places in the state that would have a huge challenge um, adding more people, and there are some places in the state that can add a lot of people if there's an appetite for more density. So, you know, it's there, and then the, the real answer is how much money do we want to spend on water? Because there are lots of opportunities to develop new resources or to pay current water, you know, users of water for current purposes to, to reallocate. Um, I think Arizona can add a lot, a lot of people. The question is, do we want to be that state? You know, and I, you know, I live in Phoenix. I live in an old SRP irrigation. I grew up a mile away from where the house I own now, my husband and I own. And um, when I grew up, I walked to school through citrus orchards. It was still, uh, you know, half farming. It hadn't been developed out. It was kind of a lovely residential area. And it, there aren't any orchards there anymore, but it's still pretty lovely. And part of the reason it's lovely is the smallest lot is a quarter acre, and you know we still have flood irrigation. Um, there's still flood irrigation being delivered in my neighborhood. Would would eventually that change and people give up those water rights so that that water can be delivered to the West Valley or the Far East Valley for more growth? Maybe. Uh, not my. You know, it's not my. I'm not campaigning for that. It's not my decision. Um, but, but, you know, that's why it's so hard to answer. Quarter acre lot minimums, that's pretty, that isn't very dense. We could get a lot denser and have a very uh, modest increase in consumption. It's still the case that in many parts of Arizona where there are cities, <laughs> in the Phoenix area, over half of the water goes to outside landscaping. So as you grow dense and you reduce that, commitment to outside landscaping that frees up that water for other uses by people. And I should also add that we recycle in Arizona over 90% of the water that enters the waste stream is reused. And so we have, um, any time we move to using water in a way that allows reclamation rather than evaporation off a yard, we, we have more sort of, we can stretch those supplies more. So, a lot more people. Do we want that? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> uh, a couple of questions. Do you have uh, scorecards on communities up here? Yeah. We want to, and um, especially you know after uh, touring Prescott Valley with, or the Big Chino with John Munderlo, I think it would be. I'm ready. I'm ready to do it. To do it. Um, I when we started this project, we got a, we had some cities say we love it. We, let's do it and some city said like why should we bother we already know you know the water manager was like we already know and so we decided let's just work with the willing let's do scorecards for all the cities that are willing and then we can take those to the ones that aren't so excited about it and we know that it, it's you know we're in Phoenix it's harder for places that are out of Phoenix to know me personally to know my grad students and feel like okay I want to I want to invest the time in having this effort with you. So we felt like we should concentrate on closer to home um, cities before we started to go out. But we have got data from some. I'd like to do Prescott and Prescott Valley. Um, we've done Flagstaff, Payson. Um, they were, Payson's very proud of where it is. Flagstaff is too, um, for very good reason. And so I think they felt pretty more comfortable, you know, getting going on it. I, I think another point that's important to remember is with regard to active management areas, mm -hmm. the active management areas in the central portion of the state all have access to CAP. CAP. Yes. And we have this one little outlier with the Prescott Active Management Area, which is dependent on groundwater and will likely always be dependent yep. on groundwater. Yep. It's a completely different story. Yep. Uh, so I think that that's important for people to remember too. I agree. I think the CAP, for more, you know, the. The reality of CAP water is there's going to be very likely less of it. You know, um, the Colorado was over allocated. We've just gone through a huge 
huge battle in the state of Arizona to decide how we'll live with less in the next six years. We are, going, we are now at the beginning of a renegotiation among the Colorado states to decide how are we going to live with less long term. Um, so the CAP, the water itself, that allocation is less important than the infrastructure. The infrastructure is really quite amazing and there are opportunities to use it in ways that you know, we haven't done before. There are aquifers, there are basins that are um, huge, that are nearby, and it, if, the, you know, if somebody wanted to do this, it would be very expensive, but water could be taken out of some of those basins and put into the CAP to deliver water to places along the CAP, right. And you know, we talked before about exchanges. Potentially, someone, if someone wanted to do it, <laughs> some cities or developers, um, it would be possible, and there are discussions about building a desalination plant in Mexico in the Sea of Cortez and taking some of Mexico's Colorado River water in exchange for um, the desalinated water that Mexico would get. That only works if the users in Mexico are urban because you don't put desalinated ocean water on a field, you know, an alfalfa field. So. What would that do to the Sea of Cortez if you have less water coming into it? Yeah. It, yeah, it, it probably winds up being fairly trivial um, in terms of how much water it is. So, but there, it's a big question. And of course, um, Mexico you know, has a pretty robust environmental consciousness. And so there, that, that's certainly part of the discussions. So. I read a little bit about Israel mm -hmm. and their desalinization. Yeah. Can you? I, got, I was lucky enough to go for a tour about a year ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can you so, a bit yep. why they are so successful mm -hmm. doing I, what I would I came away saying I hope we're never as desperate as, as Israel. And so they are it's it's amazing what Israel has done in terms of water, water resilience and yet it's all out of a kind of necessity that we have never ever had since statehood. Right. Um, we would never want to get to that point of necessity in my in my view. Um, so Israel has built, I think they have seven ocean desal uh, plants and it's a huge part of their water portfolio. And it's because they have ocean um, and otherwise they're surrounded by hostile, uh, basically hostile countries, neighbors. And so, and they knew, I mean, Israel knew that water was gonna be as important to Israel. And by the way, it's the size of Connecticut, the population is like the size of Arizona. So we're not, you know, it's, it's very different. Uh, it would map differently, <laughs> but, they understood very, very early that water was going to be as key for them as it would be for Arizona. And so um, Israel decided to nationalize water management. And we have kept water at a very local level. You know, we keep, like Prescott Valley has decided, the city of Prescott Valley, every developer has to figure out the water for the development, consistent with being an active management area. That's a, that is a very interesting strategy, you know, to put it on the developer. You figure out where you're gonna get your water, you know what the rules are, figure it out. That they've, they've identified a supply of water that developers can use, but still, it's the job of the developer. Israel said, we're going to nationalize this. And so the federal government basically implements water planning and delivery all over the, country. When I was there, Israel talked very proudly about how we reclaim whatever 70% of our water. And I said, well, you know, we're reclaiming like 93% of our water. And they said, what do you do with it? And I said, well, a lot of it winds up going into aquifers to recharge them. That's a big thing all over the state, not only in AMAs. And the Israelis said, oh, we wish we could do that because they are basically mining their aquifers and they're using reclaimed water to grow crops. So that's what they need to do. Uh, it, you know, and they do it very well. I don't mean to diss it at all. It's really impressive what Israel has accomplished, but it's, you know, it's sort of necessity is the mother of invention. And, and I came away thinking, I thought Arizona had challenges. You know, we are, we're really fat and happy compared to the challenges that an Israeli water planner faces. And then this other piece is Israel is only waking up to the environmental consequences of some of their, the, these historic water uses. And, um, you know, you can't undo those things. Those, 
the, in the U.S., we woke up to them 50, 60 years ago. And, and so there are lots of places where, because of that consciousness, and the Verde River is a good example. I mean, the Verde River is now, you know, a, um, it's, a tour, it's an ecotourism um, sort of place in the Verde Valley. Um, we wouldn't, you know, Israel doesn't have that opportunity because of the, the pressures on their one river. The Red Sea, dewatering, all of that—it's really, it's really interesting. Okay, got one more question. Yeah. Whatever happened to the federal government's desal plant in Yuma? It's there. Is it it's there, there. Um, and, and it isn't you might explain operating. Yeah. Yeah. Out of the mound, or, or yeah. Well, it. Um, so the bef the big thing about ocean, you know. Let me just say that the big thing about any water augmentation project to remember is that water is extremely heavy. It's just heavy. So moving it from where, from its source to where it's needed is often going to be the most expensive part of the water supply. And the CAP canal is a good example of that. that that's a very expensive project that we're going to be paying off well into this century. For another 50 years or so, we're going to be paying, we meaning People who live in the CAP service territory are paying a property tax to help pay off the canal, and we're also paying as I'm paying as a water user in the city of Phoenix. Um, anyway, so as for the Yuma desal plant, um, that plant was built, and the idea was that we could deliver, we could put desalinated water into the stream that reaches Mexico. Um, so that Mexico, Mexico was having issues with the salinity of the water that they were receiving. A lot of it being that water that's returned from irrigation winds up being saltier than the water that was delivered onto the fields. And um, so it was part of a bigger strategy of how uh, we would be sure to deliver our 1.5 million acre feet to Mexico. And what has happened is, yeah, where it's, it was too costly, it didn't make sense, but it's still there, a desal plant that works. Um, I, I believe they are. They are upgrading the membranes so that it could be turned on again, um, but it isn't in operation. And the fact is, Yuma is not going to, the Yuma region does not want to be the water supply for the Phoenix area or Pinal County. And so Yuma jealously protects its water resources for Yuma. And that's, that's an understandable decision. And so, there are people who say, why don't we just take, there's a, there is a mound, like a growing supply of brackish water in the ground as a result of all the agriculture in Yuma. And some people say, well, we could pump it out, desalinate it, and um, somehow turn that into a supply for the Phoenix area. <laughs> that it's always like at the end of the road of some people's thinking. Um, maybe take out more CAP, more water from before it ever gets to Yuma through the CAP. And then Yuma can use this desalinated water, you know, for Yuma's purposes. And Yuma says sort of like, you know, when hell freezes over, that's our water, that's our water in the ground, that's, you know, that's, that, and it, that's the, the way, how we are now. So it's kind of interesting that you would ask about Yuma and ask about Israel at the same time. Um, you know, I'm really agnostic about this, but, but I, I feel like Arizona really has grown on this idea that the people who want the water are responsible for finding the water and making it happen. And we've had a few times when we've done big things like the CAP or Roosevelt Dam or other big projects that serve larger communities. But for the most part, we have, we have stuck with this idea that if Prescott Valley wants to grow, then Prescott Valley needs to figure out its solution. If Buckeye wants to grow, Buckeye needs to figure out its solution and so on. And mo more often than not, elected officials want me to explain why aren't we having statewide, you know, some kind of statewide water project? Why isn't this happening at statewide or multi-state? And I always say, well, <laughs> you're the elected, you know, you're like, <laughs> that's, that's a question of governance that, that uh, is far beyond, you know, the things I, you know, I'm going to answer about. Yeah. Recognizing that within explanation area, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Agricultural use for water was capped mm -hmm. with in, in AMAs, yeah. Within active Ex areas. Yes. Not true outside of AMAs. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking specifically about what we're experiencing now in Mojave County, mm -hmm. Paz County, 
where we've seen a huge increase in water demand for new irrigated agriculture. Yeah. A lot of times to produce crops that are being exported not only out of the state, but mm -hmm. out of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, is that going to be part of the story uh, that you're going to be able to portray? Yeah, I think it needs here? to be, but I do, um, I always want to question that the crops are being exported because I, I know there's a lot of manufacturing going on around here and it's using resources and I wonder if you would turn to those manufacturers and say you are not allowed to export any of that right I mean we we have Intel in Chandler and certainly Intel is exporting its its uh, production and they're using a lot of water to do it and and the state in a way the economies benefit when there's export so I, I personally think it's, it is inconsistent to single out agriculture and say, you're not allowed to export. You know, you, 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 you only need to grow for here, right here in the state or right here in the US. And by the way, we eat a lot of produce from Mexico and we eat a lot of food that comes from the Midwest. And I, you know, I think it would upset us if someone said to Mexico, you can only grow for Mexico and Iowa, you can only grow for Iowa. So I, I take issue with the idea that we need to, that there's even a question about where the production goes. Farming is a business and businesses sell where they have buyers. But unregulated development of new wells for new, you know, high demand, high water demand um, uh, uh, industry like farming, I think that is an important question. Um, and it's a really intractable one. I mean, how do you solve that? Once they're in and they've made this, you know, a prop, someone comes in, buys the land, develops the wells, develops the orchards, in some instances, Mojave County pecan orchards, they make a big investment. How do you turn that around? You know, I think it's very problematic. Um, I, I don't know what the solution is. I think it's largely going to have to come from those communities and I think it really involves engaging those farmers. Those, they're big ag operations. They're, for the most part, sophisticated. It's not little families who don't understand what the situation is, but engage with them to help come up with a long-term solution. And, you know, but it's definitely probably the hardest problem to solve in Arizona. Yeah. Let's maybe do one more question, and then we'll let uh, Sarah have some lunch. I think we, we covered it all. All right, well, thank you all. I really appreciate the chance to talk with you.